Welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast. I'm Jerry Thompson. Here with me, as always, is Brian Gottlieb, and we, we got it all covered, man. We're going to talk about everything. I like when we get to talk about everything. Have a nice, broad discussion, cover all of magic. Of course, tons of stuff going on in every format right now. A lot of turmoil, a lot of changes, events coming up to play, all that good stuff. So we're going to cover a little bit of everything. Potpourri, if you will. Play Jessica Luca. That's it. That's game. Pack it in. Yeah, that's the cast. Uh, (laughs) Every format. So Wizards made part of our job easier where we don't really have to cover two of the formats because they made a tweet uh, that says on Monday, June 1st, there will be an update to the BNR list impacting the standard and historic formats that will also address the companion mechanics. So not going to spend too much time talking about those formats because they're just going to change. Mm-hmm. But what the hell does this tweet mean, Brian? What does well, addressing the companion mechanic mean? I took that to mean nerfs. Like something is going to change mechanically in regards to how the companion mechanic works. Like you're going to have to mulligan and then put the companion into your hand, or you're going to have to pay a tax on the companion every time you cast it, or I don't know, something. However, they want to fix this clearly broken mechanic. How many times do you get to cast it? What? You only get to cast it once, so I don't know if the tax actually works. Well, um, if you start if you start with a tax of one, then I suppose it would work, right? So everything's just one more expensive. Yeah, yeah. That's probably not the best solution to this. Uh, I I do think like the force mulligan thing is okay ish. I mean, none of this is okay. You, however, read this differently when we were talking before the show. You thought that this just means no more companions, possibly. Uh, I think they can leave some of them. I don't think they have to ban them all in like every format or whatever, but I, yeah, I I just was confused by the nature of, we will address the companion mechanic. It could just be they're addressing it by banning some of them or whatever, but they refer to the mechanic as a whole. Right. Right. And And that's why I didn't read it that way. Yeah. So it's, it's straight. It's like, you can't, you can't address the companion mechanic by saying we're going to ban Urian and Obosh and Luris or whatever. Right. Because then people just start playing Numori or something, you know? So I don't know, man. I, it, it does read to me because it's weird language that it seems like some sort of nerf or errata thing is going to happen, but who knows? It's not, it's not that far away. We'll get to figure it out eventually, but I really don't like any sort of inelegant solution and you know, if I have to like mulligan to put the Luris in my hand and then I get thought seized or whatever, I'm just like, what, what are we doing here? Why does this card take up a slot in my sideboard? You know, why can't this just be in my main deck and I start with it in my hand or whatever? Like, But that should be the, that's the essence of this. There should be a question that you have to ask somewhere along the way of, is this worth it? As opposed to just an already solved question of, yes, this is always worth it. Do it no matter what, or you're a fool. Like, that's what we're trying to get to here is having yes. there be a cost. So... Well, they kind of already, you know, went past that point. Like, I mean, I guess you can implement some very inelegant fixes. We'll see. I, I guess it's worth noting that it's arena and his, or it's standard and historic, which are both only on arena. And right. that could have something to do with whatever change they implement. But, uh, uh, but again, obviously we're just speculating. Nobody knows. I, know. I, I read this as companions are affected Everywhere, not just in standard and historic. Did you read the Ooh. opposite? Yeah, I guess I guess you could read into that, Mr. Lawyer. That is something that you could definitely do. I don't know. I think it's going to be funny when they're just like, yeah, we're banning Urian, and that's it. <laughs> we're throwing uh, a lot of darts at the wall trying to get them but to no, stick. I mean, it, it's weird that they didn't touch any of the companions in the older formats, right? And it's possible that they didn't do that because they knew this announcement was coming up. So, right. I don't know. So, we'll see. Why don't we move back a little bit, even like back it before? Up. Welcome to the Arena out. Deckless podcast. No, no, not that far. You went too far. I'm having Spaceballs flashbacks right now. Dude, you're old. I know. Let's talk briefly about the announcements of announcements. Because every time I read these announcements, they come out, we're making changes next week. I have this moment of... Why are we doing this? What is the purpose of taking this step? And then I compose some snarky tweet and then a bunch of people yell at me and I give in most of the time and I'm like, okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And then it happens again. And I'm again confronted with the, why are we going through this 
lame duck week where we just speculate and nobody plays the format because nobody cares about it anymore and your testing is completely stopped when you can just make the announcement. Now, the only way I can defend it is if you want to say something is happening, but you still don't know exactly what is happening yet. And you want to gauge crowd reaction or you know you have to act, but you want to use every second of available time to try and get the perfect solution. Do you think that's what's happening here and why we use these announcements? Or is the decision already made and for whatever reason, we're just sitting on it for a week? I So I think that the decision is made already. I'm not sure why we're sitting on it. I do think they could have said something specifically about the companion mechanic because of the bad press that they've gotten in the last week. But I also think that they would have announced an announcement regardless. So I don't know. Interesting. I I don't think there's any correlation between outstanding issues, bad press, and these type of decisions. I think they're just operating completely separate from each other. But Probably. But well, so like the the decision to ban stuff or whatever they're going to do and the bad press that they have, like those things are separate. But once you know that you are going to ban something, the message that gets crafted is crafted by the same people who craft the other messages. So there's some amount of overlap there. Maybe, but this isn't a new policy. Like this is just how we do things now. We always do the one week announcement of an announcement. Right. And that's, that's the thing I don't get. I I think that it works out somewhat favorably for them where it's just like bad news, bad news. And then it's like, Oh, companions are maybe getting banned or whatever. Something's going to happen to them. Yay. Let's, let's rejoice and like forget about all the nonsense that just happened. And, I don't know. It's it's weird to me where you would make this announcement before the arena open where it's like people mm-hmm. are probably going to be like testing for that and preparing for it. And just like, doesn't it just knock the wind out of your sails knowing that the format is just entirely going to change after? Like, obviously, you still have this tournament to play in. Right. Right. But now you're just like, well, I don't want to think about current standard. I want to think about future standard to some degree. Like that is always what happens. Now, for us, 100%, that's what's going to happen in our case. We're going to have the wind knocked out of our sails. I'm checked out of both these formats. I'm not going to participate in them. A bunch of people, though, had the announcement just been the actual change, would feel completely differently. And they would be like, all the effort I've put into testing for this arena open is now invalidated because these cards have changed. So this way you get a heads up that your testing is going to be invalidated. And this is the argument that people always make to me. And I always go, okay, I understand what you're saying. And then it comes back the next time this announcement happens and I feel flustered one more time. Well, I so I guess if it does look kind of shady, if they're just like, look at this arena open and we already talked about kind of what a money grab it was. And then on Monday, they're just like, oh, thanks for buying all these packs. Now we're banning the deck that you put together and spent all your wild cards on. So right. I guess I guess they can't really not announce it in this scenario because it would just look pretty bad. But yeah, still, I they. They would have announced it regardless, right? Like you said, there is precedent for this. It would have happened. I don't even know why we're still talking about it. I don't know. I don't know why we talk about any of the things we talk about, but we do every single week here on the Arena Decklist podcast. Thank you for listening. You want to do some more spe- wild speculation about what's actually going to happen when these bands come down? Uh, No. Okay. I'm going to. <laughs> here's, here's what I would ban. In standard, I want to ban like eight cards. And I just think you need to go hard. You need to reboot. There's no time for half measures. Standard has not been great for a long period of time. And if you're really going to grab attention and say, we recognize these complaints, you're right. We can do better in the future. We're going to do better in the future. And we're going to start by serving our customers right now. And it's a good time because nobody can play paper magic. We're all trapped inside and you're going to get refunds on your wild cards, which, you know, there's certainly some loss still. If you buy a bunch of cards surrounding a card that gets banned, then you don't get reimbursed for those. Yeah, uh, what about I, my premium Lucas that I bought? Yeah, I, I think the impact is less now than it would be in most scenarios. Obviously, there's no good time for bans, and I hope we get to a place in the future where there never needs to be a ban again. That would be ideal. But in this moment, we need to face the reality of the situation. Reality is standard, a bit of a mess, has been for a while. So I'm going hard. I'm Taking out Urian, depending on whether Urian is just going to get nerfed into the ground with the rest of the companions. Don't know what's going to happen there. If it's not a really hard nerf, I want that card gone. I want Fires gone. I want Wilderness Reclamation gone. I want Teferi gone. Don't ever want to see those cards in standard again. Out. Get away. But what about Corset Teferi? 
Uh, let's hope it's, it's not time raveling. <laughs> Next up, taking out Uro. Card's too good. Don't want to see it. Taking out Cauldron Familiar because I'm old, I'm uncoordinated, and I don't want to click a bunch on Arena anymore. So let's just get that deck out of the mix. We'll leave Witches Oven around. Maybe you can find something else to do with that. Also going to be going, Nissa. I've put up with you for long enough, Nissa. I don't need to see you anymore. I don't need you doubling mana. I don't want to just play against a bunch of giant Hydroid Crasuses. You're gone as well. Get out of my face. Finally, Agent of Treachery. Just bad news. Any way we're cheating this into play is going to feel ugly. Be it Winota, Luca. I don't care. Even if Urian's not blinking it as often as it was, it's just a really, really feel bad card. And I'm ready to be done with that as well. And I'm chopping all those cards. Get gone. Remember when Asian of Treachery was just like a mid-range mirror breaker and that was like pretty cool? Yeah. 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 yeah we don't we don't live in those times anymore. We don't. And I remember the first time an Agent of Treachery was cast against me. And I was like, oh, this is actually nice. Really good tech. Take my Teferi, bounce your Agent of Treachery. Cool, cool. I like what you're doing here. And then all of a sudden it was taking two of my permanents on turn five. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that was so much less cool. Yeah, that's that's not very cool at all. Uh, right. s- speaking of which, if I if I play the arena open, I am going to play Jeskai, I believe. Of course you are, because you <laughs> are not only a participant in the arena decklist cast, you are also a listener. You have heard our arguments that we have made over and over for weeks now, just begging people, please just play Jeskai Luka. Hasn't changed. Nothing has changed. Best of one, best of three. I don't care. Play this deck. The numbers are preposterous. I played some best of one today. Deck felt mm-hmm. pretty good. Didn't I even have to think you. about how to sideboard. Easy. Easy game. Love it. Put put some Aether Gust in my main deck, which was not very good against the uh, array of decks I was paired against. But I do think that you want something to interact with mirror matches. So I think that's probably a decent choice. But I don't know. It could, it could certainly be wrong. Uh, we talked a bunch about not caring about whether a card is inefficient in certain matchups if you're already winning those matchups. And if the matchups where Aether Gust is dead, you're just dominating anyway. Who cares? Really doesn't matter. Yeah, the the thing that concerns me is that it basically takes up one of the anti-aggro slots. So if you're not playing against uh, Mono Red specifically or one of the green base beatdown decks, then it's not really an anti-aggro card. Mm, so, so the concern is like mono white, you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah, mono black. I did, I, I did. I did lose to mono white. I believe that. that did happen. I proposed mono white as a reasonable deck in my article this week. I think there's a way to build it that maybe has some value. This is the enchantment one, right? My take was actually it wasn't mono white. It's Boros Experimental Frenzy based with just a billion one drops and venerated loxodon. Okay, no, that's cool too. I'm I'm down with that. Uh, the one that I played against was like pants. It was bogles, basically. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that around. One of the lists I saw in Moto was Splashing Season of Growth, which also seems pretty good. But nice for 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 the decks that you'd be targeting in best of one, I don't think you want to splash. I think you just want to give them the beatdowns. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah, played played against Mono Red, just beat them up real bad. Got clowned by mono white and then i don't know like beat fires beat some flash deck whatever i was just like this deck's not really reasonable no it's a historically good deck and uh i think we will certainly see several cards leave it at least one i mean there's no way this deck stays intact but i wouldn't be surprised to see several cards what do you think about my band proposal are, are you on board am i just completely nuts overboard crazy and there's no way anything like that happens there's probably no way anything like that happens it's tough to just be like all right, a year of us suffering through this nonsense. And they're just like, no, this is fine. This is fine. This is fine. And then it's just like, oh God, the house is on fire. Everything's burning <laughs> down. We just have to ban every, just ban standard, ban your trade binder, just get them out. The only thing you can play is Scorch Spitter and Heraldic Banner. That's it. Nothing else. <laughs> I just want to make people happy to play Magic again. Like that's what I really want. And so all these cards, which have been the focal points of so many complaints over months and months, Comes Just with a cost, them all. though, man. Comes with a cost. I know. I know. The, co- the cost is less than it has ever been. It just feels like something drastic is needed. Maybe this is a complete overreaction. And a lot of these cards are certainly... This is my first draft, like my really broad take. 
I could certainly see a world where I actually sit down, think very carefully about the ripple effects of each one of these individual cards being removed from the card pool and can get to a much more compact package of cards to take away that still yields a successful change in the format to something everyone can enjoy. I am definitely down with Fires and Wilderness Wreck and some sort of Simic card. I, I think no, those no interest those, in Teferi. I think Teferi is so bad because all these problems that we just can't interact with, like it's the disdainful stroke problem. So many of these cards are awesome, or disdainful stroke is awesome against so many of these cards. You can never play disdainful strokes if a Teferi ever resolves. Yeah. It's just completely invalidated. Yeah, but I don't. I don't know. I feel like you're you're just banning like all the payoff cards anyway, right? So like, is is that actually going to matter all that much? I don't know. I feel like Teferi Teferi is egregious, obviously, but it's. I think it's the second tier. Okay. And if, if Urien stays around and Lucas stays around, I'm super happy just getting rid of Agent because there's Luca and Winota to cheat it into play. So right. not it's just really way too big, early. Yeah, not really a big fan of those strats, but I don't know. We'll see what happens. I, I would expect small changes, but what do I know? I mean, I've I've been pretty off as far as trying to predict what they're gonna do lately. Sure. Yeah, it's tough. I just see this as a time to swing for the fences, but maybe maybe that's just... I have no consequences to my wrong decisions. Nobody's going to get mad at me for banning their cards away, theoretically. So uh, very easy for me to just yell out eight cards that I don't like. Yeah. Uh, what, what about Historic? Like, if you played this at all, is this a real I format have. to you? No, I, I actually played a bunch of Historic this week. It's the only form of Magic I played this week, in fact. I uh, just wanted to know what was going on with the format, thinking I might write about it at some point. It's medium as a format. Like it has basically all the same flaws as standard with a few more <laughs> tacked on. And I think that's what you really have to get at with this round of bands. Again, it's very easy to cheat powerful cards into play. There's Jeskai Luka there, which is very good. There's also the Winota decks. And I mostly see them in the Naya form. And they're incredible. I, I, like I think they're so good. Instead of cheating an Agent of Treachery in those decks, though, you're tre- treating an Angrath's Marauders and just killing your opponent on the spot, doing preposterous amounts of damage. Which is basically a giant Obosh. Yeah, super Obosh that gets to attack right away. So it, it does feel like something should change in that format to make it less just linear, slam these cards that everyone already hates in standard. Like you, you put all these really interesting cards into the card pool for a reason. And I think you should work to make sure they are unlocked, but the power level of the standard cards is making it very difficult to do right now. So my guess is something is going from Winota, maybe Winota itself, and probably Nexus of Fate because people just hate playing against that card. And I understand why, and I don't see any good reason to keep it around. Dude, that card sucks. Uh, Do you think if they ban Nexus, which I hope they do, that I'll get re-reimbursed wild cards for the Nexuses that I own on Arena? I have because no that idea. would be gas. That would I be have gas. No idea. Well, hold on though. Isn't historic the format where they don't actually ban things and they put things on? I don't remember what the uh, term was for like it. Some pause suspension. List or they go on suspension. Got loopholed. Wat- Watsy loopholed. What is the what does the announcement say again? Does it mention it just, said ban, but that could just be like shorthand. Because nobody actually thinks of these things in terms of suspension, despite right. how the format was initially set up. Yeah. Or or at least the person constructing the tweet did not think of it in terms of sure. suspensions, you know? I, I didn't at first. This literally came to me. This is the first time I've actually had this thought. Yeah. I, I, I had never thought about that. I was just getting greedy. I just wanted <laughs> more wild cards. Gone forever. <laughs> yeah. More wild cards. Sure. Uh, yeah, those are the two cards which I'd put at the top of my watch list. Maybe there's some other stuff you're supposed to take out as well, but the format feels a little bit too new for that. So it feels like you're just trying to hit the really egregious stuff. And that's what strikes me is the really egregious stuff. I think if anything was ever banned in standard, you could probably safely ban it in historic, which like doesn't doesn't really play because, you know, historic should have like wider card pool. They have the historic sets. Right. That are supposed to, supposed to be like tailor made for that or whatever, and those could potentially solve some problems. That yeah, well, like they brought Feel of the Dead back, right? Or excuse me, yeah, Feel of the Dead. They brought Feel of the Dead back, but they put in answers to it in like Goblin Ruin Blaster, and now we have uh, it's like Field Ghost of Ruin. Quarter. Ghost Quarter, yeah. So way more answers than there were previously. Yeah, and then as soon as they did that, I played Feel of the Dead in Historic and just clown people. It was great. 
Really good. It's a really good <laughs> magic card. Yeah, I probably not in this format when you're when you're doing Winota things, getting like Winota things, but yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they put Crypt Breaker in a set. They put Timely Reinforcements in a set. They're trying to get me to play more. Yeah, and Timely Reinforcements. I saw that one for you, you and I was like, oh, Gerald's in. Who, who even thought about doing that? Because I just, I want to high five them. Yeah, your, your last fan at Wizards. It's just like, I like this Jerry guy. We're going to give him some Timely Reinforcements. So I start building Jeskai Luka decks with Timely Reinforcements. I'm just like, this is great. Mm-hmm. I just love this. Sounds nice. It does sound nice, but... Uh, yeah, given like I, I had heard rumors about like how messed up the format was and I hadn't played since Field of the Dead. So I was just like, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll take other people's word for it and not mess with it. Yeah, it was a good exploration process. I had a nice time, but there's there's definitely some stuff that is very much an outlier presently as far as power level goes. And I think some good bands will do that format well. It's nice to see it take off, too. I'm just happy to have a second constructed option to play on Arena because there's there's no chance I would play standard right now. So it's nice to be able to use my yeah. cards and have something to do. Yeah, you need something to do. I know that you would love to just get dirty and some block constructed, but that's not really how magic is structured. So Nope, won't give that one to me. Sorry, buddy. You're going to have to play Eldraine Theros block constructed. <laughs> With all the cards unbanned. Enjoy. Yeah. Any Anything reasonable for best of one? Would, would you just hands down like play Jeskai in the arena open and that's it? You're not even going to budge on anything else? I think so. I mean, like I said, I, I'm not fully engaged with standard at this point. I have no reason to deceive our listeners. I haven't played standard in quite some time now. I follow it very closely and I've paid attention to what's going on. I look at results constantly. Uh, so I still think I have a sense of the format, but that sense just points me very clearly in one direction. Jeskai Luka's messed up. Keep playing it. Yeah, the numbers say so too. Uh, what about Pioneer? Format's interesting right now. I find myself constantly intrigued by the decks I see doing well. There is a, again, some just like problematic cards that I wish weren't there. And I feel like that's a recurring theme in a lot of these formats. In Pioneer, it's more about the play experience. And I know what like the Lotus Field decks are doing in the format i know what their role is and i think it's an important role to be filled i kind of just wish a different deck was doing it it's not a fun play experience and there there's not enough different about pioneer to pull me to it right now especially again we talked a bunch about how the loris experience can be like pretty net positive for actual gameplay but just being beaten over the head with companion right now is not where i want my play experience to look like and the loris problem in pioneer is pronounced it's basically like lotus field loris urian or else you're wasting your time yeah trying to think of a deck that breaks it i guess garuda yeah that's not good that's not a good answer either <laughs> that shouldn't that shouldn't be your like good case uh like so people were playing inverter with urian which i think is wrong and i think people are now going back to 60 card inverter which is very much correct so mm. there is that deck but i kind of can't I, I put that in like the Lotus Breach camp of just like, why does this still exist? But the companions are first and foremost, the the issues of the format, I think. And then we can talk about getting rid of those decks. I'm still just weirded out by those decks still existing. The companion decks? No, Lotus Breach and Inverter. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. They don't feel good. They're not a good play experience for the most part. And you wish that There's a lot of potential in this format. We've seen it shine through a bunch of times. And I've often made the case that this goes closer to like traditional magic than most other formats right now. There's a lot more interaction and back and forth. And it's definitely something I appreciate. And the inverter decks are a part of that. But is there still a reasonable like inverter shell that doesn't use that combo kill that is still very interesting to play against? I think it's possible. I mean, maybe it has to be Sultai at that point, but... That's good. I think that was a positive deck to have around, at least from the the beginning of Pioneer's existence. So there's something here that's pretty special. I think this format still has a lot of potential, but it does feel like the companions are clouding that right now. So this is where I'm really hopeful that we're talking about global nerfs and they can be brought down a peg. Yeah, and like I said, because of the prevalence of these cards in Legacy Pioneer Modern, it does feel like that is probably what is going to happen. It's going to be more of a heavy-handed thing than 
just like you know spot banning them in each format or whatever i think that makes a lot of sense right yeah there was a pioneer challenge i remember i looked at this a few days ago and i think the first through ninth place decks were just Lurisurian, and i i wouldn't see any reason to do anything else like it just makes sense that that's what these decks look like right now it actually goes deeper than that. I'm checking again. It goes all the way down to 11th place when you hit Canister playing 60 card Inverter. So yeah. it takes a while before you escape the Companion uh, Quagmire. Yeah, not great. Not great. Remember when when we wanted to like ban Dig Through Time and like Arclight Phoenix looked like it would be really good in the format? And... It's so weird. It's so, so weird how quickly everything has changed. Life comes at you quick, man. What do you think about these uh, Azorius decks, which seem to be doing quite well, well right now? I see them holding a lot of places in top eights. Uh, they look like standard decks for the most part. Pretty much. I, I am intrigued by the cycling versions of the control decks because yeah. you, you actually get a bunch of like good cyclers. You have Illumination and Sensor and stuff like that. And then if you have the Fox, you just like cast it on one and give them the beatdowns. But just the like Planeswalker, Omen... Urian stuff. I just don't understand why you would do that versus Luca. And we're, I mean, we're seeing that in standard too, right? Yeah. So that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but if Luca didn't exist, I'd be like, okay, this is obviously a reasonable thing that you can do, but eh, it's just not really my thing. Okay. No, that's a fair assessment. You need a reason. We, we talked about it at length. We did our cast on the powerful cards and how it is often correct. Just find ways to get the power into your deck Passing on Luca Agent definitely feels like a mistake in a lot of places right now. For for what? Absorb? You kidding me? That's that's the thing. There is a lot of mono red in the format, in in fairness. Yeah, but it's not like absorb is just like, oh, you know, that 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 card really helped me. Or like if people are smart, they just play around it. Right. And it it gets really bad really quick. And it's definitely not a card that you want four of and all this stuff, you know? So I would much rather have red, have Clarion, and have kind of like this combo finish, but yeah, whatever. People are allowed to do whatever they want to do. Yes, they are. God bless them. See, I think if I were playing Pioneer, I would probably play Luca. I would not be mad if people were playing 60 card inverter. Cedric won a PTQ with Garuda, and he was telling me stories about that today. And it, it, it kind of reminded me of whenever I played Hypergenesis and Legacy, it just always mm. created like the most messed up stories because you're not actually playing magic. Yeah, every now and then I like to dabble in that no magic path. I've played some Dredge in the past, plenty of Ad Nauseam, which I think checks some of those boxes in a lot of ways. Yep, so yep. I, I don't mind strain from the beaten path, but <laughs> I, I don't think the Garuda decks are actually good. I mean, Cedric is just very good at magic. He's very good at like, finding the best lines just playing tight games and his deck selection is garbage as i tell him quite frequently he would win with a ham sandwich and that encourages him to keep registering ham sandwiches i kind of feel like the garuda decks are still in the ham sandwich phase but companions messed up powerful mechanic always having access to your combo piece if you win the lottery that day just gonna win a ptq yeah there was a very very brief period in like 2010 where Cedric wanted to borrow a deck for a PTQ after busting out of day one of some extended Grand Prix and his person didn't show up in time. So the only person he could get a deck from was me. And obviously I had some counterbalance deck, right? So I gave him this counterbalance deck. He had like never activated since he's divining top before. And he started Oh, one and one. <laughs> and part of it was like not knowing how his deck worked and just like taking too long to spin top and resolve top and like sequence his turns and stuff. And then according to him, he's like, no, okay, I'm 0-1-1, one one, but I'm pretty sure I have it figured out now. And sure enough, he won the rest of his rounds. It was like five or six more rounds or whatever, got ninth. And he's just like, dude, is this what you've been doing to people this entire time? Like this deck seems busted. I'm just, I'm just going to go to you from list from now on. And I'm just like, hell yeah. And then just like, you know, the next season he's playing white weenie again. Or whatever, oh yeah. So. It, it lasts a week. I can't tell you how many times I've had this discussion with someone when they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to take your deck advice from now on. And then two weeks later you catch them just playing some absolute nonsense. Yeah. You're just like, Hey, what are you doing? Put that down. You know, I say stuff like that to my cats all the time. 
It's basically Cedric whenever he's playing Magic. I see they won a PTQ and he didn't even tell me that he was playing. But I'm just like, Garuda, what are you doing? Yeah, he, kn- he knew you would yell at him. That's why. Yeah. But who's got the chips? So whatever. It's true. Don't play Garuda. Just uh, probably probably don't do it. Uh, what what are your thoughts on modern? I'm about to I'm about to sneak attack you here. Well, I feel very good that you and I early on in the companion process identified these red black uh, Luris decks as the way to go forward, and now they're just everywhere, like yeah. absolutely everywhere. So I'm happy we nailed that one. I like these decks. They're very much my play style. Saying that, I hate these goddamn companions and I'm so (laughs) sick of them. And I don't want to do this anymore. The joke was funny the first time. It's not funny. I don't want... Just take your Mishra's baubles back. I don't need them all the time. I'm I'm good on all of this. Dude, But the deck deck is solid. Check this out. I started playing this really bad JRPG and... You kind of go around and collect these different monsters and you start off by getting this really messed up uh, four winged cat thing. And I named it Luris. Okay. I just, I got to have Luris with want, me. You all want time, more so. Luris in your life? That's really what I, you're seeking right now? I just haven't had enough yet. So I'm, I'm here for it. So you must love these red black decks then. Oh, they're great. Yeah. yeah. I, I still like the, the blue ones better, but like these decks are definitely cool. Like, this is a very cool, eh, maybe slightly less cool, I guess, but still very cool Mardu Pyromancer. That's basically what these decks are. I like the the decks that are slanting even more aggressive these days. I'm seeing more like Kiln no, Fiends. Eh, they, they probably should be, but I, I don't like it as much, you know. <laughs> so you can see it's correct, but just out of principle, you don't like it. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Felix built a Niv Magus version a while ago. I saw that. You know I saw that. I just have like a, a Google alert set up anytime anyone around the world speaks about Niv Magus. That's, that's got to be just like crickets, right? Yes. A, it's only Felix, actually. Yeah. Okay. Just once every six months, he just comes out of the woodwork with, we did it. Got to dust right. off those ground riffs. Right. I get all excited and then hmm, disappointed once more. You're like, oh, it's it's not busted? Come on. It had its chance. Liliana the Veil doomed us. Someday, yeah, someday they that really card did. will be relevant. It's it's coming. Uh, Any day now. I think they figured uh, out that like Gitaxian Probe is busted. And we're just not yeah. going to have stuff like that ever again. So Yeah, you think no more free magic cards, but... Oh, I'm that's true. A few times about that. That's true. Dude, maybe we should have got in while, while we could with Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time? Yeah, we probably missed the boat there. Damn, we blew it. Dude, you did like Once Upon a Time into Spirit Guide? That's actually a huge... Uh, uh, why are we having this discussion again? That's actually a huge problem with the Niv Magus deck was like when you started with Niv Magus, you were in such a better position than if you didn't. Pretty obviously to the point where we were playing like Flamekin Harbinger. And if you just had Once Upon a Time to go get your Niv Magus, maybe that's good enough. Maybe. Now, well, we need the time machine to figure out if, if we wasted our not. chance. Damn it. We could probably we never beat our Boreal it. Grazer, though, let's be honest. Hell of a magic card. Uh, anyway. Anything else you want to do in this modern format? Besides, I mean, it's funny. We talked about how we weren't going to spend a lot of time on standard and historic because it seems like they're pretty invalidated with these bands, but it's the same thing going on. Like, if there's a really a companion nerf coming, Mm, All of this yeah. is irrelevant. These these are just mono companion decks over and over, and the entire format changes overnight if companion takes any kind of substantial hit to its playability. Like here, we oh, go man. down. You're right. You're right. We should we should just call it and the cast here. <laughs> just pack it in. Yeah, like I'm I'm looking through a uh, the modern super qualifier now, and of the top uh, eleven, thirty two, nine, yeah, nine 32 of them decks. are companions, and the exceptions are just insane things like Eldrazi Tron, which can play Giganta in some instances if it wants to, I think. It's tough, um, but yeah, you can. And then you get to Ad Nauseam, which has had a lovely resurgence as of late. Perhaps to Ad Nauseam for getting the job done. All right, so so Luris, the, the red Luris decks are cool and everything. I, I do love a good Rakdos mid-range deck. I still like the, Rak- or the Luris control decks. I still think that they're quite good, and I don't really know why people aren't still playing them. But they're they're a lot harder to play for sure. But I, I feel like anytime I joined a league with it, like I was just a lock to go four one or better. 
Uh, so I still like those decks a lot. And then what won that super qualifier? Uh, it was won by Tron. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. writing about this week, buddy. That's the sneak attack. Oh, use the Tron guy now, huh? Dude, I'm loving the Tron. That is an unexpected turn. What do you think about this particular Tron list? I'm looking through it now. Two Karn Liberated, killing those sacred cows. Yeah, I mean, they also have uh, two Thought Knots, two Golos, a weird mix of Eldrazi at the top end, no Oblivion Stone because you have a bunch of permanents. Yeah, and uh, Karn the Great Creator and basically no sideboard. So... The deck, the deck is weird, and I'm not sure if all those changes are correct. I think some of them definitely are, but Tron as a whole, I think, is just going to be a natural predator for the slower Luris decks and the Urian decks. Yeah, this is a pretty dramatic shift from classic Tron, and uh, it speaks to someone who really did their homework, thought carefully about the format. You don't arrive at these kind of numbers by chance. Like, There's something going on here. It's, it's non-zero that they just put cards in their deck. Let's be real. No, there's... Oh, my God. Uh, if so, then this person is just like a latent genius. It's just yes. there inside of them waiting. I agree out. with that. I agree with that. It's interesting to see Big Mana make a return. Nothing is really hard punishing it right now. There's not like as many Blood Moons as you would expect for the fact that there is a black-red deck kind of sitting atop the format. So, yeah, get it done. Go after him with Tron. Well, that's kind of the thing, right? Is like, who are you trying to Blood Moon? You know, like the the mid ranging control decks have Astrolabe, and then <laughs> the the red decks are a little bit more mid rangey now, and there just hasn't been a lot of big mana. Period. So, I don't know what what are you trying to do with all that? I've seen like some Molten Rains and sideboards, but that's about it. And then you just get to play things like Thought Knot and Golos, and your lands get blown up, and you just don't even care. Yeah. No, I think that's a fair assessment. And even like, I mean, you see stuff like Boil more frequently now and just just weird cards designed to address a very weird metagame. And whereas you always would account for Tron, like, oh, I need to account for big mana strategies. Well, you kind of didn't going into this particular event and props to just taking the swing and going after him with Tron. I love it. Yeah, I think, I think Tron is kind of busted right now given the way the metagame is. And... Obviously, you're going to have some issues with like the straight burn variants of Luris, but those have mostly been supplanted with the Rakdos ones. So Tron mm-hmm. is just going to have a good time right now. I mean, obviously, there's the the rando ad nauseum and stuff like that, but whatever. You know, you're you're still good against like 70, 75 percent of the decks that you're going to play against. Right. Sometimes you just have to roll those matchup dice, sleeve up your cards, get to work. Or you could play Rakdos Luris and have a 53% win rate against everyone. You could do that too. Not come Monday, Gerald. Things are changing. We'll see, man. We'll see. What is what is the most impactful nerf that they could do that would basically not change the playability of all the cards? I I don't think that's possible. I, I mean I think you have to you have to hit their power level. That's the only way you can change these cards and i it just seems the cleanest one to me that doesn't actually like fall afoul of reminder text is some kind of mulligan requirement to have the cards i heard people talk about like you're not allowed any other sideboard if you choose a companion oh come on that seems way too deep down the rabbit hole that probably just kills them anyway so it also doesn't solve the problem of just playing like the bad game. If they do somehow survive, then you're still just playing the exact same game. So I, I think somehow bringing them into your hand via Force Mulligan is the way you have to go. And it it certainly makes them worse. Uh, does it make them enough worse that they're not still some of the best cards in the history of Magic? I don't know. I, I would just have to play games under these various restrictions and see how they feel. I, I think that's a huge nerf. And... Maybe it's worth it. But they need know. a huge nerf. Like, I think know, of how I preposterous know. they are. I was thinking like, you just cut a toughness off all of them. I think you need to have That's the not, cards play as they say. I That's know, it's it's not feasible. Preserved. But like, I think if you did just cut a toughness off of all of them, they would still see roughly the same amount of play. Yeah, I'm not even sure they're actually all that worse. Like that was one of my complaints about the companions is that if you minus one, minus one, across the entire board they're probably still like some of the best cards ever made yeah oh well maybe they'll give them all a toughness 
<laughs> just really throw expectations on their ear. Yeah. You, you, the magic community was complaining that they wanted more. Here you go. More toughness. More toughness for everyone. Uh, what about our good friend Legacy? I'm really just covering all the bases today. Legacy. We're doing Popper next. Are you ready? Uh, I looked at Popper decks. I even built a few I in looked. Magic Online. And of course, our regular listeners know we get our cards through Card Hoarder, who very generously takes care of us. Props to them. So I could certainly go and get any Popper deck from them. I wanted to. But I was just like, you know what? Sometimes it's a little bit cumbersome to have to go and do the trade request. So maybe I'll just like buy the whole popper format. And that way I just have these decks in my account. They'll be the only cards in my account. And I can just hop around, play a bunch of popper. Then I found out what the popper decks cost. And they're way more expensive than I expected them to be. So the majority of cards are very cheap. And then there are yes. outliers that are like yes. 10 tickets. Yeah. yeah. And so like each deck I tried to build was like 70 tickets. I'm like, I'm not spending $400 so I can play this format once and realize I don't actually like it. So I think <laughs> you would like actually it, go down that route. You think so? I think so. Dude, I, so I clicked on a league and I'm, I, the first deck list, I'm like, okay, whatever. Second deck list, I'm just like, oh, I'm in love. Was it the Mardu deck list by any chance? No, although I'm definitely no. in for that. This yeah, is, there's, there's like some Mardu lists that get me very excited. This is Tireless Tribe Inside Out, but also is kind of controlling with like Squadron Hawk of One Mind Circular Logic. Okay. Looks dope. I like the way the like red white base stuff looks, you know, Squadron Hawk, like card advantage Monarch type stuff. Faith I've Spitting, never actually. Prismatic Strands. Yeah, Prismatic Strands sounds like it's in there. I've never actually played games with the deck, though. So who knows if I actually take the leap and dive into the popper format. But on its face, it seems like it has a lot of the features of a format I should enjoy. There's no Planeswalkers. All these cards I hate aren't there. Yeah, the, the problem is that there are a lot of decks that just don't really try and interact with you. Like, there's a lot of boggles -y type stuff. But there's a lot of blue too, you know, like there's a lot of just Delverish type strategies. That right. So you, you have seen much better than everything else, honestly. Well, you have stupid counter spells, right? And they already have like a 7 7 attacking you on turn three. It's probably bigger. But don't than those that. decks just win way more than everything else for the most part? Yeah, probably. Like the counter spell decks. Yeah, people just don't have good bogle lists. I don't know, man. Anyway, I wasn't <laughs> even trying to talk about Popper. I was just kidding. But I know. I don't know how we did 10 minutes on it. Uh, you fix. Popper Bogles, you figure that one no, out. No, no, absolutely tell you, not. I would love to say that I have better things to do. I don't. But you but don't. I'm still, yeah. I'm still not going to do this. Okay. Dude, self-assembler self Tron? Are you kidding me? Sounds You've good. assembled Tron and this is the best thing you can do? <laughs> you can crop rotation for your Tron lands. And that's the best thing you can do is self-assemble. The payoffs are not great, Gerald. You, you I don't believe this. what you're given. This is crap. People were not self-assembling last time I looked at Popper. They just weren't. Haven't things been banned, though? Like, when was the last time you looked at Popper? Uh, they banned... So, like, I looked at it a little bit before and after Astrolabe. Okay. I played, huh. I've played, like, a League of Popper three or four different periods in time. I feel like back in the day, I used to play it a lot. I can't put my finger on, like, what decks I played, but I don't know. I have, like, vague memories of thought casting with chromatic star and having to like set up the priority properly and all that kind of stuff. That was extended and standard. Nah, I, I wasn't playing standard <laughs> during that time period. So I think it has to have come from popper. All right. No more, no more talking about affinity. We're going to ban yeah. affinity from the rest of this podcast. Uh, legacy go. Let's talk death and taxes instead then, because that is what won the most recent challenge, Urian, Death and Taxes. And here is where I was just like, enough Urian. Because if Urian actually makes this deck better, then the problem is not anything surrounding it. It's, it's just Urian. Like, it doesn't fit. This deck should not improve by going to 80 cards and adding Urian. The drop-off in its key cards should be so dramatic that it can't stand the loss. So if this deck actually gets better by including Urian, that's just it. I can't take this card in the format anymore. It has to go. That's probably true anyway, quite frankly. But again, we have some kind of nerfs coming because if Urian isn't making Death and Taxes better, it's certainly making the best control decks way better because they're all based around Arkham's Astrolabe and now Abundant Growth as well. 
So just done with Urien in this format. And this is what I said would happen, honestly. I wrote about the companions in Legacy. I did my top 10 list. I had Loris number one, Zerda number two. Those cards are both gone now. And while I wrote the article, I said, okay, maybe you can just go ahead and ban Loris, which is taking up a lot of the metagame share right now. Yep. But then the next companion up is just going to step up. And I hadn't contemplated a Zerda ban at that point. It just seemed like Loris was sure to go. They both went, but now here's Urian, and it's just in a huge number of decks. It's absolutely overpowered for the format. I am very, very glad there is a nerf coming. I hope it hits Urian substantially. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm still not buying it. I don't know why it takes me so long to be on the fence about this stuff, but. You still don't buy that it is a problem in the format? You think it's just like people well, messing up and making their decks worse and winning despite that fact? Like Urian and Death and Taxes, for example. That that strikes me as nonsense. It's like, oh, I look agree. At, look I at agree, but here it is. Your, look at how big your recruiter of the guard toolbox got. Like, no, no, I want I want Aether Vial on one. I want to draw a bunch yes. of like wastelands and stuff. Oh, I guess you can like Caracas this thing. And they're playing for Caracas. Maybe that's it. That might be game over. Maybe. Maybe that's enough. All right. I'm 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 all about Urian Death and Taxes if you're playing for Caracas. Okay. It didn't take much to really swing you there, but I'm I'm glad we got you on board. That's that's silly. That's silly. I forgot that these were all legends. Whatever. Urian, Urian, everything else, blinking, your astrolabe, that is silly. Astrolabe should go at some point. Until that happens, can I recommend you a Sultai deck list that I sent you like three months ago? Has it been updated to include Urian in it by any chance? Oh, no. No, I, th- I think it's worse than... Eh, maybe it's not worse. I'm going to say it's worse than playing 60 cards. Okay. That's going to be proven false eventually, probably. And you're going to remember some card maybe. that makes that not true. Because you just get to, you just get to play your four Ice Fang Quaddles and four Baleful Strix and then have Urian blink all of those. And you have Astrolabe anyway, so it's all fine. Yeah, do I want to play like Abundant Growth though? One of, so one of, there are two things actually. It's Brainstorm and Force of Will. I think the amount of Force of Wills can be I don't know, somewhat avoided by playing more Force of Negations. It's not really the same thing, but whatever. I do think that Brainstorm is really important. But I do think that when you have like Ponder, Astrolabe, Abundant Growth, you have enough stuff to do on the early turns, like enough filtering. Yep. You're definitely not going to find the exact stuff you need as as well as you would if you're playing like Ponder, Brainstorm 60, you know, and like obviously that engine is pretty busted. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't know. But you're, you know what, though? Your catch-up mechanisms, alongside all the Urian stuff, which is in and of, of itself a catch-up mechanism, your other catch-up mechanisms have improved so much. Things like Uro being able yeah. to just snowball the game really hard. I, I just don't think it matters. I think you are supposed to be doing this stuff in the early turns. Your early turns are slightly worse, and then you catch up so hard in the turn, you either play Urian or do your other busted thing that it just doesn't matter anymore. Damn it. All right, play Urian. Okay. Oh, this is like kind of gas, actually, because you just never run out of lands to fetch. Not that that really matters, but it's it's really annoying when you have to like crack a fetch to shuffle after your brainstorm. You don't get a land. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. It doesn't, it's happened to doesn't me a bunch matter. In Legacy. Doesn't matter in the slightest. But I don't like it. All right, I'll try. I'll try Sultai with Urian. Thank you. That's probably correct. I was very happy that I was able to play a Sultai deck that didn't have a Luris, though. Right. So you can you could play like Oko and Uro. And I was happy that the format went back to like how it was before Companions came out. Because because that Sultai deck is nice. And for people playing like four color, just stop. Stop. I, I understand you have Astrolabe. You don't have to do it. Looking for a little discipline from these legacy mages. Come on. Why? Just playing Swords to Plowshares for no reason. Here's another why. Why? Do these Garuda decks have to exist? I mean, this is just Char Belcher turned up to like 11 and you always have your Char Belcher. This won the legacy, most recent legacy PTQ in the hands of Bob Huang. Just a straight combo deck, a little bit of flexibility and disruption in Thought Not Seer, but pretty much just jamming your Garuda as soon as possible, winning the game on the spot. Again, something that doesn't See? feel like it should exist. Need, need those force of wills, man. Force of negation doesn't touch it. it. It does stop like all the acceleration, but still. No, you're right. That's it's a real downside, 100. Uh, and I'm I could see a benefit of having 60 cards, and your sideboard cards matter a bunch against this deck. So 
that's they have four, that's they have all four fine. camera souls they have four camera souls man it's fine uh, they just always cast it anyway okay yeah i mean i'm not saying this is like the best deck in legacy but man does it suck that it even exists and they get oh, to yeah. this so consistently oh yeah and we're again we're just going to hope that this entire cast that we have poured our heart and soul into over the last i don't know how how deep are we now an hour or so we're we're going to hope that all of it is invalidated when you <laughs> sit down to play magic next week what a world adding a toughness to every companion you heard it here first yeah somehow i i doubt it i doubt that too i would bet against that <laughs> anyway legacy legacy's kind of tight actually you're enjoying it despite all the companions floating around I, I am enjoying modern and legacy. I'm not enjoying the other formats, but that's me. Do you, that's just me. Do you think you can enjoy them more after a companion nerf? Is that possible? Like, are there parts yeah. you are enjoying yeah. companion based, or is it just something you're kind of playing through and suffering through it? I think that both formats that I enjoy currently would be strictly better without companions. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel the same way about every format. I think it is time for this drastic nerf. It's certainly an unprecedented step in Magic's history, kind of. I mean, you know, we've seen changes to the stack, changes to the legend rule, but this is more geared toward a specific class of cards. But just look at how this conversation we have had today is just warped. Like, this is all we can talk about. We wanted to come in and just cover every format, but you can't mention any format without discussing the impact of these companions. There's nothing else there. And that just speaks to the need of a pretty dramatic change, maybe an unprecedented change in Magic's history. Legacy is Sylvan Library Uro. That's all I want to be doing. I hope you get the chance to do that again, Gerald, safely. I realized in the course of putting away all my Magic cards, which I have now done, I somehow only have one Sylvan library, which made me very sad. And it also got me thinking because having now taken stock of my entire collection and put all these cards away, there were certain cards that I have distinct, very clear memories of possessing that I did not come across. And uh -oh. these are cards that go back decades, which means I think there is a possibility that somewhere in my childhood home, there may be a box of magic cards, including a Legends Sylvan Library, which I could not find, an Alpha Lanawar Elves. I can remember the tournament I bought it at. It was the first tournament I ever went to. I paid like $4 for it. I was so excited to have an actual card from Alpha, but I don't possess this card anymore. You probably and loaned it to like Jason Ford or something. That's possible. It is possible I just loaned it out, but it's also possible there may be magic cards at my childhood home, and I am into that possibility. I don't know that I'll ever get to travel the 3,000 miles to that home again, but maybe sometime next year I can go on this investigation and see if I can turn these cards up. Cho went to his parents' house in Korea. Uh, I think this is like four years ago or something and just found like a bunch of wastelands and a sneak attack and stuff. Awesome. Was, it, was, it was like more than four years ago. But yeah, it was just There's like, no oh. better feeling. It was just like random garbage that he left behind when he came to the States, you know? And it was like, oh, wait, no, these cards are just a million dollars now. Yeah. It's such a great feeling when you find the, those old magic cards that you had kind of written off, realize you just have gold on your hands. Yeah, I know what happened to all of my old magic cards and roughly about what I had, you know, just like Korean ancient tombs, stuff like that, where it's like, mm -hmm. well, those were like $2. So I didn't really take them with me. And then they died in a fire, not a literal fire, but they ended up getting thrown away as I burned bridges and uh, just like, okay, yeah. You know, like th those, those boxes of cards would probably be worth a lot right now. Yeah. We're starting to sound like the old, I don't know if you had this experience when you were a kid, but I collected like baseball cards and all of your parents love to tell you how they had the Mickey Mantle rookie cards and uh, they were yeah, garbage yeah. and they put them in their bike spokes. And that's how yeah. we're starting to sound with our old magic cards that we've lost track of. Yeah. I had a bunch of sports cards too, and those were just gone, but like I, no one would ever buy those. So it's fine. Oh no, no. Our generation of sports cards are completely worthless. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think all the prices are just made up. It's like, you have to find someone who wants them. Right. And it's like, who's going to buy singles from like the mid nineties or whatever. I don't know. Whatever. Right. I wasn't there's sad no, to lose. There's those. no game, no game behind them holding them together. Yeah. I wasn't sad to lose those, but I just remember having those Korean ancient teams, man. I'm like, damn it. But it, at the nice time, at the time they were just like banned in everything, basically. Like you couldn't play them. Sure. 
So yeah, never going to need these again. Yeah. Oops. Oh, well, everything is fine, except for all of the magic formats. They'll be fine come Monday, Gerald, after this announcement comes out. Dude, Everything hopefully. will be fine and great. I, I am, think I'm, I am excited I'm gonna, for it. I'm going to try and stay up late. So like, oh, no, that's going to be like noon my time or 11 my time. That's going to be tough. You going for the kid on Christmas thing where you just yeah. wake up in the morning and you get a new format to play? Yeah, I was going to try. And then it's just like, I'm so excited to play, but I'm going to pass out instead. Yeah, this falls pretty sweetly into my wake-up time. So uh, I, I'm in line for a good Monday. I, I yeah. hope to be pleasantly surprised by what happens. Dude, you're the worst. You're going to like wake up, read the internet, go for a run. And while you're running, you're going to like think of all the sweet things that you can do. And then you're going to come back and then play Magic and have all the stuff worked out. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. I, Gerald, I deserve this, okay? I've, Dude, I've put up such, with a, a lot of bad living. formats. Trapped in my home for a long time, I deserve a nice run and a nice standard. That's all I ask out of life. Yeah, and you're the only one who's had to deal with all that stuff. You're right. <laughs> it's just me. I'm the only <laughs> one with problems. Please give me a good standard. Well, if if I try and stay up and I just I break at like 9 a.m. and I have to fall asleep, when I wake up, I better have some deck lists or some thoughts from you. You got it. I'll put them in our Discord. I'll share them with all of our patrons. So that way everyone has all these sweet new decks. All right. Cool, man. Let's do it. Is it question time? It is question time. We have a cool question this week, too. Yeah, this question's weird, but it's great. So uh, every week here on the podcast, we solicit the fine folks in our Discord for their burning questions. This week was kind of weird, so we just took questions on everything. And we selected an even weirder question and that person is going to get an arena deckless enamel pin, only place you can get it. And that person is Felix Liu, who we talked about earlier on the podcast. And Felix asks, what card that lost a fan vote in 8th edition would you most want in modern? And my answer to this is, what the hell is Felix talking about? Yeah. So this is a really, really interesting story. And I think this became a topic of discussion I think Gavin was talking about this on his daily magic show or something about that. I, I saw him tweet something related to this okay. that has brought this conversation to the forefront of magic right now. But for those of you who did not know when eighth edition was going to print, looks like in about 2002, when they were wrapping up the set list, they allowed Ooh, that's magic probably, fans. That's probably why I missed this vote is like, I didn't really have internet access. Yeah. So I was playing Magic around this time. I had gotten back into Magic via Magic Online. And my participation in Magic depended whether I was in college or not, like living with my college roommates. And when I was, I was in the Conjurer's Closet and not playing Magic openly. <laughs> so I wasn't participating like openly. And I, I don't recall being part of the 8th edition. Dude, uh, I went, I went to high school with... PTQ top eight pins on my backpack. So I am proud of you. I honestly, I don't say this like with, I'm not trying to make myself sound good because I was in the conjurer's closet. I regret it. And the fact that I was unable to like own who I was and what I really loved was really disappointing. And I, I talk a lot about like today's youth. And it's funny because usually when people talk about today's youth, they're doing it like old man yells at cloud style saying everything that's wrong with them. I think so many things about today's youth, are right. I think they do such a better job in a lot of instances of like supporting their peers. And I think they're also way more accepting of like, everyone has their thing and you can do your thing. But like, for whatever reason, I felt like I would be outcast if I did my thing when I was younger. And I kind of hid the one thing I love more than anything from so many of my friends. And I really regret doing that now. Yeah, no, that is definitely a thing that I have not thought about in a while where people are generally far more open about the things that they do like, which right. is just awesome because awesome. as it turns out, I'm sure there were like a lot of people who were in your college that would have played magic and like, you could have had new friends or like yeah. gotten your muggle friends into magic or whatever. Like a lot of different things could have happened in your life if things were different. Obviously. For sure. And it's, it's so stupid too, because like, all of us were at the same time pretending not to be nerds. Like we all love nerdy crap. It's just for whatever reason we had to, we had convinced ourselves that we had to pretend to be cool all the time. But and I'm you sure can't, you can't, you can't play final fantasy. You can only play Madden. Right. Like, <laughs> that's, that's the only cool thing you can do. 
Yeah, it, it's just so laughable looking back on it. And it's like how I actually got into poker because like poker scratched a lot of the same itches, but for that time period, it was cool and everyone was playing poker and you could I could be super devoted to a strategy game and not feel like I was outcasting myself. So that's the road I went down. Uh, it's really weird to think back on in retrospect, but I am happy that things feel a little bit different these days, at least as an outside observer. It does feel like people are more open with their hobbies and their loves. And it's just, it's good to see. I'm, I'm proud of all of our young magicians out there. Me too. Anyway, eighth 12 edition. Cards. 12 cards they could vote on. They could vote on 12 cards. And it's, sometimes there's a set of cards, but basically two cards squared off against each other. The one that won the fan vote got included in eighth edition. Now, maybe it doesn't seem that interesting at the time, just one print. But what ultimately goes on to happen is that eighth edition serves as the cutoff point for modern. So now it turns out, you know, almost 20 years later, this voting actually did a ton to shape the future of, of modern. So some cards could not exist. Some new cards could be included in the card pool. Let's talk about what was excluded, what was added. Two-headed dragon defeated Crimson Hellkite. No one cares. Necrotal defeated Dark whoa, Ashling. No whoa. one cares. Two-headed dragon ne- was my, my jam. All right. Whether it was your jam or not, it has done nothing in modern. I'm glad you got to have your time with two-headed dragon again in eighth edition. Well, I, I didn't. I was, I was over it at that point. Uh, yeah, rewind defeated dismiss. That was a big one. Yeah, so it's it's kind of weird to me that we've never seen Dismiss in all the years since. It doesn't feel like it really crosses any power bridges, right? No. It, it, so like Cryptic Command got made and it was like, oh, the third blue will make it not as good as Dismiss or whatever. And it's just like, okay, that's a joke. Uh, but yeah, I think four mana counterspell draw a card is what they would put at above rate for some reason, even though there's like Thrilled Mystic and stuff. Right. Yeah, it's weird. It's a card I would have expected to come back around, but hasn't. Either way, don't think it was going to be a huge player in modern. Here's where things start getting real interesting. This vote, Ensnaring Bridge, defeats Static Orb. And maybe either of these cards makes a difference, but Ensnaring Bridge certainly made a huge difference. I mean, cost you a Pro Tour if you want to go down that road. If you didn't bring it up, I was gonna. <laughs> Not that I lost specifically to the card Ensnaring Bridge, but... Uh, so Static Orb is a three mana artifact that is players can only untap two permanents on each of their turns. And I don't, like both of these were like kind of lock piece E, lock piece adjacent. Static Orb yeah. usually comboed with like opposition or something like that. And given how modern is currently, or at least how it was three to six months ago, I don't think Static Orb would have made a like much of a dent, but certainly against like these use your mana every turn, like Yuri and Uro decks, like static orb would be great against them. But in yeah. steering bridge overall has definitely made its impact felt on modern. And I don't know exactly what static orb would have done. Uh, I don't think it would be as much though, but then in steering bridge would not be in the format. Right. Yeah. I think that's the big part of this vote is just the inclusion of that card. So it's possible that people were like, yeah, Ensnaring Bridge, like no one no one plays with that card, right? And Static Orb is just this hellscape. So they they basically voted Static Orb out of eighth rather than voting Ensnaring Bridge in. Wild, wild stuff there. Anything else to say about Ensnaring Bridge? You ready for the next card? Uh, that's just a terrible vote too. Like The vote for Ensnaring Bridge is terrible? Or the, the fact that those are the two options? Yeah, it's like, where's my third option? Yeah. If, if two people... I don't like are playing against each other. Who am I, who am I going to root for? Right. I'm rooting for the chandelier to fall and crush them both. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Putting and the lock pieces against each other is that's what I'm, special. that's what I'm hoping happens for this vote. Unfortunately, in steering bridge got in, but yep. Uh, next vote, noble purpose defeated Orm's prayer. Doesn't really matter. Birds of paradise and vine trellis defeat Llanowar elves, utopia tree. Birds would ultimately be reprinted in Ravnica anyway, so that was getting into modern one way or another. Uh, here's one that matters a little bit. Worship defeats Pariah and Kismet. Another lock piece, kind of. Yeah, kind of. And another card that is shown up in modern sideboards. But like worship is mostly being the the hero of the story. It's never never like worship is being the villain, right? You're preventing yourself from dying to like affinity or boggles or burn or whatever. And I think that that's fine. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. And Pariah and Kismet would have just both been blanks. So okay with Worship showing up. Although I found out you're a big Pariah fan when we discussed this before the cast. No, you were just like, oh, Pariah, that does nothing. And I was like, whoa, buddy, slow your roll. This card used to be OP. All right. Hit me with those Chomano synergies. Yeah, not not in tournaments, but just like end of the lunchroom, you know, high school. Yeah, well, I couldn't play in the lunchroom because I didn't believe in myself enough. So now we know why I didn't know about Pariah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, you just didn't have any any opponents. All right. Next up, Obliterate defeats Jockle Hops. God. I actually said Jockle Hops is possibly, possibly could have gotten into modern at some point just because yeah. having the Armageddon effect is like super interesting and unique. Well, and you'll like, I don't know, discard some prized amalgams or something and bring them back. I don't know. I don't know what the hell you would do with it. But yeah, Hops could see play. Obliterate just ain't gonna. But people no. love Can't Be Countered. Yes, they do. Yeah, and it would be very interesting to know like what section of the player base was voting on this. I mean, like 2002, the overall player base, so much smaller, a fraction of what is now. And the player base that's like going to whatever this was, Daily MGG at the time, to actually vote in these polls. I mean, I wonder how many votes actually decided these matchups. Or, or I wonder if uh, R&D people got to vote on them, you know? Like, you could just log in from your own browser and vote, right? So right. maybe, maybe they're like 10% of the vote, 5% of the vote. So further down in this article, which we will include in the show notes, if you want to go take a look at it yourself, there's actually voting on flavor text. And the, they get like 8,000 votes per oh, flavor okay. text. So I don't have the numbers for the voting on the cards, but I would expect probably a little bit more than 8,000. So that's probably more than I expected, I think. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Ooh, the numbers keep going down, though. Yeah, people got less and less interested as time goes on. They were really invested in what the flavor text for Aladdin's ring was going to be, and then it declined from there. Oh, you got to vote on the Artlands, too? Man, so smart. Yeah. So smart. They should do this again. A lot of crowd participation here. This, this is a big ask to make all of these votes, though. I don't know. What if it's just yeah. like, you know, one or two votes? I like it. I like bringing it back, giving the fans some say. You know, that yeah, always goes well when you put the power in the hands of the fans. Yeah. You end up with Bodie McBoat magic card or whatever. Bodie McBoat? What? The, don't worry. The internet gets it. You can check it out after the show. Okay. Uh, next up, here's a big one. Maybe the biggest one on this whole list. Blood Moon defeats Dwarven Miner. We could be playing a modern where you would have never lost to a Blood Moon lock. Instead, you would have had Dwarven Miner sitting across from you and you would have won on the spot because your opponent was foolish enough to play Dwarven Miner. No, dude, Dwarven Miner's gas. So that. Come that, on, there's no chance Dwarven Miner would ever matter. In Dwarven Miner was mostly good because of Chrome Box. But, but. Uh, Dwarven Miner was a four of, I believe, in the sideboard of that counterbalance deck I gave Cedric. Okay, look at this. We've come all the way back around. So I've I've played that card. It was gas. Uh, I played it in like the sideboard of Astral Slide to try and beat up on Wake decks, Marari's Wake I decks. I, I think I remember that because that was the period where I was playing Magic Online. So I'm and, with you for that one. And that actually mattered because that, that matchup was like slow enough, you know? Mm -hmm. And... Just at some point, they'd be like, okay, well, I played out all my basics, and now you're just going to kill every non-basic I play. And then there are some games where they go non-basic, you play Dwarven Miner, and you you just kill a land every turn, and that's what you do. And I mean, it's, it's, it's not fun, but it did stuff occasionally. But yeah, Modern's a little bit too fast. Blood Moon would definitely have more of an impact overall. And this this one is bad. This, like... This definitely affected things. Oh, for sure. This this is one of the defining features of modern going forward. And world could have been much different had this vote. I wonder how close it was. I would love to know how close these votes were. Were we like 10 votes away from just playing a completely different modern for the last 10 years? I don't know. Aaron wrote this article. We could uh, ask him. I would, I would love to know. I mean, I don't know if he knows the answer to that, but I, I would certainly love to know the answer to that. And also... <laughs> To bring things back around, it speaks to just how important voting is, Gerald, and how much your vote matters. You could have Word. saved us from Blood Moon for years and years, but you chose not to vote, and now look at where we are. Well, I didn't have the foresight to see how my vote would affect things, but now I know. This is and, why. And now I will make sure to vote. vote. I've learned. Aaron 
will probably not know the answer off the top of his head, but I do believe that if you're like, hey, about that eighth edition vote, he'll be like, what do you want to know? And he will probably know where to find it. I would love to know this information. I'm going to leave it up to our listeners. Listeners, get me this information, please, and thank you. All right, next up, Natural Affinity defeated Nature's Revolt. Don't care. Yemen yeah. Enchantress defeated Rabid Wombat. Don't really care. Glorious Anthem All right, hold defeated on. Crusade. What? I care. I care about Yav Maya Enchantress because these, like the first phase of my magic existence, when I just had a bunch of cards, knew nothing about the game, and like trying to make something, some kind of sense of all of this, usually involved Yav Maya Enchantress, Rabid Wombat, Lores, Thicket Basilisk. Like that's the synergy I could piece together. So these cards. Uh, they have a lot of meaning to me. Or it wouldn't be, excuse me, the one the Enchantress I'm thinking about is the one that draws a card. Verdurin. What's the first one? Verdurin right. Enchantress. Verdur- Verdurin Enchantress, yes. But Rabid Wombat was a critical part of those decks. So that is a card with a large part of my heart reserved. And, and this vote is kind of messed up, right? Because if you are Enchantress Wombat dude, you we have to- both. Yeah, you can't have them both. What, what kind of deck are you supposed to build? Right, like back then, back then they didn't print a lot of playable magic cards. So if right. this was like the enchantment payoff, it's like, well, you got to wait another six years for another one. What could have been? There could have been so many rabid wombats running out all around modern. Anyway, uh, last one: Glorious Anthem defeats Crusade. Cool. The last three, not not very big deals, but yeah, people voted on Blood Moon and Ensnaring Bridge being in modern, which I did not know about. Like I said, this vaguely rings a bell now that i'm seeing it but weird i'm just thrilled we got to have a very real tangible example of the power of the vote show the people how important it is to get out there well but but brian what if the vote was you know 80 20 people really love blood moon why would it bother if you voted do you hear my silence as i refuse to engage with you on the topic or (laughs) or what if we're talking about ensnaring bridge Versus Static Orb. Static Orb, and there's no winners. Look, no, which is very similar to our current election. And Snaring Bridge versus Static Orb, unfortunately, defines uh, the state of American elections pretty well. And you really aren't looking for either of these things, but sometimes. Chandelier. Chandelier. Gotta stop the creatures from attacking, and you go with Snaring Bridge in a situation where there's really no winners. Something's gotta be there. May as well take the one that's preventing you from getting killed by the rabid wombat. I I suppose that's game. Good luck.